Hey everyone, Vancouver Radio, episode number 263. And so, we changed the format of the podcast a couple of weeks ago. I binned Rachel off, did a high line from the wires, wrestling style. She's out the door, Tom's in, and Tom uh, is on the other line right now. We've got some very good feedback from Tom being on the show, being the new podcast co-host. Um, I said it might be a match made in heaven. A couple of people on Instagram piped up and were like, yeah, go Tom. Anyway, Tom is back. We're going to cover some more of your questions. Um, Tom, how is today looking for you? Today is looking all right. Um, I've d- done one of like the things that I always try to do, and I managed to actually get up early and start at work at like 6 this morning. So it means that I might be able to train this afternoon. So I'm quite looking forward to that. But other than that, so Tom, if you're, going in, if, you're, if you're going in the gym this afternoon, what are you going to do? Um, today I am squatting, so I've got to work up to a max effort set of two, and then take ninety percent of that, and then hit as many sets of two as I can until the bar speed slows down. Okay. Then I'm going to dick about my leg press for a bit, and then come on. <laughs> I'll, tell you, I'll tell you one uh, I've fallen in love recently with a 45 degree leg press I haven't mm, used one I'll... for quite a while but the pressure that that puts on your quads is sexy no I love a leg press it's one of those because I, when I started training I trained in like a warehouse style gym then I went to another warehouse style gym and then a crossfit gym so this is the first time I've ever had a leg press before so I'm actually developing quads it's weird yeah, and I flex my I flex my leg. It moves. <laughs> <laughs> I'm the same. I'm uh, I'm training my legs twice a week currently because it's the off season. I'm trying to train them every three days, and mm. um, I don't. I'll be honest. I can't follow a workout program. I have workout ADHD, so I chop mm. about, I chop and change. So like yesterday, I did a tricep of uh, a goblet squat with a Romanian deadlift into a shoulder press. And then I did sort of a lot of leg pressing and then did some kind of like isolated hamstring work with some glute work and then just a little bit of ab- abby stuff. Token, yeah. just token abs at the end, standard. Um, <laughs> and I do that. I'll, I'll train my legs again tomorrow and I'll do something similar, but I'll just see what equipment's available, go with it. But the, the one theory at the moment is smash quads on leg press. <laughs> yeah, I mean it's one of those where I I don't know I hate when people brag about how much they leg press and like then there's the whole thing where people who squat loads talk about how the leg press is just like a worse exercise it's like I'm sorry but it's fucking hard <laughs> like, like if you leg press heavy it's difficult and it makes your quads grow you can't argue with the fact that it makes your quads grow so yeah uh, i'm the same i'm starting to get a little bit of quad growth don't get too excited just a little bit <laughs> just a little bit but yeah i'm actually focusing on my indoor rowing at the minute um gym that i moved to didn't have a rowing machine so i haven't been able to row in about six months Um they've just put one in though so i'm going to aim to try and get my 2k time respectable again because i was edging sort of under seven minutes which isn't like world beating, by like it, it's fairly average. Mm-hmm. But for like the, a really unfit dude, I was quite impressed with myself. And I went on yesterday, and I did one kilometre in about four minutes, and thought I was going to die. So I need to like I need to sort that out. Rowing's hard. Yeah, rowing is difficult. It's good though. It's the only cardio I've ever managed to do and not hit myself for doing it. Yeah. Like I don't want to die while I'm on it. I yeah. just feel like I'm good when I leave. For me, that I'd either do running or swimming. I don't really like rowing. Being on an indoor exercise bike is like, meh, why? Um, so, yeah. But then we've all got our yeah. thing, hey? Yeah. So, we've got oh. some questions from people. Um, we're going to go big on some supplement stuff today. We've got a question on some supplement stuff. If we've got time, we'll go into uh, some other questions. But Tom has warned me. I was like, Tom, let's try to do this podcast in like half an hour. He's like, whoa, slow down. We're going to be on the supplement <laughs> question for a while. I was like, all right, dude. And he's already starting to be the big dog, so we'll let him roll with it. So, um, Tom, let's dive in on question one. Yeah, so um, just quickly before I do, I just want to say thanks to everybody for like, the positive feedback and stuff. I've been getting some messages through the week. It's been really cool. Um, 
So this question is kind of two parts because you talked about two supplements but there's like a bit of a conversation around them but we'll read the whole thing and then dive in. So, hi Ben and the team. Just like to say I've only just in the last few months discovered the podcasts but the information, content and honesty is second to none and I'm thoroughly enjoying catching up on previous episodes. I have a question in relation to the following product and indeed any similar products like this. So the product that he's talking about is Anabolic Designs Shreddable Untamed, which is a fat burner. I've been using the product Untamed for a month now and noticed considerable strength gains come gin time, as well as fat loss effect in combination with a well-managed diet and training program. So he's training, he's dieting well, and he thinks his fat loss has been accelerated essentially. My question is, what if any are the long-term potential health impacts of taking a product like this for a prolonged period of time? Then the second half is, I would also be interested in your views on the glucose disposal agent Matador and more so glucose disposal agents in general, and if you think they have a place in a well-structured regime. Many thanks for any help you can provide, Adam. So, interesting topic, um, supplements, uh, and what you'll see is you'll very much in this podcast see the dynamic in how me and Tom work together. So, as I said on the last show, Tom works with us on the BTN Academy, does loads of research stuff for us, has spent a lot of time rebuilding our new Body Type Nutrition Foundation Academy. So, you know, with within what we do um, in our kind of education framework, I tend to talk a lot about the practical applications of health and nutrition, the dynamic of our lifestyle, why and how we do things. And Tom is very much helping us behind the scenes of like, the science of the advice that we give out and how we structure that with what we know to be kind of proven um, and how we kind of draw conclusions basically. Um, So when we look at, you know, supplements and we've, we've kind of, we've talked a little bit about fat burners before from a psychological standpoint. We've never actually talked about any physiology behind a Mm. fat burner. And there's obviously going to be a massive placebo component here because taking a particular product at the beginning of what we see as a structured regime could be something that really kickstarts someone into the mindset to say, I am going to change. I'm going to take this product. I'm going to hit the gym. And the thing is, is this is where these conversations become really hard because actually there's a lot of, there's minimal context. So what I mean is I might be at a seminar and I meet someone during half time, for example, and they come up to me and they say, Ben, I'm uh, a semi-professional athlete or I compete in this and I've been noticing this with my recovery and I've been feeling tired and I've been doing this. And I'm like, okay, 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 cool. And then I have to go through some basic checklists. So right, firstly, how well do you sleep? Oh, not great, could be better. Okay, secondly, uh, what does your calorie and macronutrient intake look like? Oh, well, it's fairly stable. Sometimes, you know, I'm consistent. Sometimes I'm not. Okay, like, so already there's two massive components there, sleep and overall calorie and macronutrient intake, that if I don't have any kind of control variable, it's really hard to then get any more specific because two of the massive components that will affect mindset, recovery, and body composition change have not been accounted for. So it's, mm. it's like looking at this now, like if someone took a fat burner and wasn't controlling their calorie intake and before that wasn't controlling or being consistent with their gym routine and it all starts to tighten this up, this is where there's a huge kind of uh, following of some products where there shouldn't be because the product has put them that person in a place where they've created structure for themselves and they've mm-hmm. you know and I did it I went on a fat loss journey when I was obese and I ended up taking all sorts of products because I just wanted them I just wanted to get it off as quickly as possible I was in that mindset where I was going to change so I took a fat burner and I took all sorts of stuff and over time I came to appreciate these supplements to work but they didn't what really kind of worked for the most part is the change that I made in my lifestyle um so I think the first key point I want to make here is that fat burners, I don't appreciate the psychology behind them that people think that you kind of need them, that mm-hmm. people feel that that is kind of the answer when it's not. We know we know what we need to do to lose body fat percentage. Um, now, I have used fat burners before in about three people that I've coached, and that's about it. And all three of those people have been... 
um, working towards an end goal of either being on stage for a, a bikini kind of bodybuilding competition or they've been doing like a photo shoot or whatever. And we've used it within like the last four weeks to get a bit of an extra boost. Like, you know, I was literally looking for like three, four, five percent benefit. Um, and it's perfect for someone like that. Now, what you've got to look at with fat burners is one of the massive key ingredients will be high doses of caffeine. So if someone is tired and they're not taking you know, a lot of caffeine in general, if I start giving them caffeine three times a day at 200 milligrams, well, that is going to have a benefit. That is going to make you move more. That is going to make you burn more energy throughout the day and feel more alert. So I think from like the cliff notes of my perspective, that's where I sit on fat burners without delving into anything physiological. Yeah, no, I would totally agree with that. I mean, it's it's the classic case of the person that starts taking a protein powder and builds a bunch of muscle. Like, that protein powder hasn't put a bunch of muscle on you. You've just started training and eating better. You've built muscle because of that, and you just happen to be taking a protein powder, which is helping you reach a protein goal alongside that. Um, and <clears throat> I don't know, I think it's because people like to have the novel thing. They like the usual thing, and... It seems like you're going to do something special. So it's like, oh, I'm going to take this product and it's going to make this happen. And then, as you see, you just you adhere to a structured routine a little bit more. I mean, I've looked at the specific products. So, so Tom, before you do that, something's yeah. come into my head. And I think this is mega, mega, mega fucking important. So yeah. what happens is people change and they attach a framework to that change. Now, when they're no longer in that change mindset, the frame, uh, the structure disappears. So if mm -hmm. I go on a fat loss phase and I do a certain workout, I take a certain amount of supplements and I go on a certain diet, when I've decided I'm not losing weight, quite often happens, you stop taking the supplement, then you stop doing the routine at the gym, and then you stop eating as well. And all of it goes to shit. And what mm -hmm. happens is that framework was built, let's just say that framework was built 20 or 30 percent reliant on that supplement adding to that structure and that framework as soon as mm. that leaves and then potentially the gym leaves quite often people stop doing the diet whereas because i'm trying to teach people that the diet is the most important thing and the lifestyle is the most important most important thing when we shift our mindset from fat loss to maintenance or fat loss maintenance to muscle gain we don't have this reliance and these mad shifts in body composition changes where people go on a fat loss phase and then go, oh, fuck it, I'll go back to eating what I want. Because the framework was never reliant on products that are not being the key driver. And I think that's mm -hmm. really important because the amount of people that I meet that go, oh, yeah, I did used to, you know, do the gym and take the whey protein and, you know, do benching and, you know, they attach everything together. And the amount of yeah. people that I meet that are like, oh, I've just started going back to the gym. What protein do you recommend? It's like that thing has to come along with the other thing. And I'm like, it doesn't have to be like that. I'm like, dude, just start eating properly again. Yeah, well, there's all those memes that you see. It's like, oh, first week in the gym starter pack and it's always set of lifting gloves and tub of <laughs> protein powder. Like, yeah. you, It's not one of those things like, right, I'm lifting now, so I need protein. Or, right, I'm losing fat now, so I need a diet shake and fat burners. Mm. Like, I think it's a marketing thing, and I completely understand the position of people who use these products because there's that much information out there that says, well, yeah, obviously, I'm trying to lose fat, so you, you take a fat burner. Like, what else are you going to do? That's what they're for. But, as you say, it's not – a fat burner, I mean – I'm going to talk about a specific product, but regardless of any effectiveness of any fat burner or any product like that, they're going to add 5% as a random figure pulled out of my head. Like, if you, and if your diet is not in line, it's not going to work anyway. Like, it's not a case that you can not be in a calorie deficit, take a fat burner, and then fat will come off. Like, any fat burner will only be effective in conjunction with a fat loss approach. Um, and... I think it really does need to be emphasized what you said about reliance on fat burners to maintain adherence. Like, I can see like this from both sides. If someone's going to take a fat burner and that means that they will be more adherent to their diet, they will lose the fat that they need to for health reasons or body composition, whatever that is. Um, and that fat burner for a psychological boost is effective 
then kind of fair enough. I think it does sort of justify the use of it. Mm -hmm. But I don't think it's a very good idea for people to think, right, if I'm going to lose fat, I need to take X supplement. Because if I don't, it's just not going to work. Like that's a bad position to be in. And not only is it not true, um, it does it disempowers you. And I think if if you're trying to do anything in life and you feel that you have to buy something to be able to make these decisions, um, you're immediately sort of removing the. I don't know you're taking away your own sense of agency. It's like, oh, I can't do this on my own. I need this product. And that's it's not somewhere that you want to go. Like it's it's not good. It it borders on reliance. Um, but with all that said, um, I mean the the specific product. It's got a few interesting ingredients in. Um, I mean I don't know if you are that aware of Anabolic Designs products, but in fairness to them, they are well like reasonably well researched. I think a lot of the product in there though. Like a lot of the ingredients in there, though, you need to look at them very deeply. So this one, as you mentioned, it's got what's called a Neurostim blend, which is always good. You've got a lot of proprietary blends, which is where a supplement will include. I mean, this one, for example, it's got 495 milligrams of a proprietary blend, which includes. So it's got 495 milligrams of these three ingredients added together, which means that you don't really know how much in this instance, you don't know how much caffeine you're getting. Mm. And I think that's always a fairly shifty position to start from. Like it would be nice if you're taking supplementary caffeine, it's good to know exactly how much you're getting because if you're particularly caffeine sensitive, if you're going to be taking more caffeine later on, you need to know the dosage of these things. Um, So it's full of proprietary blends, which is always an issue. But I mean, the most interesting ingredients in this, um, so it's got, something called hygienamine in, which is a beta-2 agonist. So beta-2 agonists are the same group of chemicals as ephedrine, so they're quite useful if you've got asthma. Um, but I've been having a look around all morning, and I can't find any human data on hygienamine that's going to affect fat loss. Um, but then we've got bovine thyroid, and like... <laughs> I think if you're taking something that's got thyroid in, like that's where alarm bells need to ring. So bovine thyroid, a couple of the issues with it are, basically it will contain active T3 and T4. And because of that, you need to be aware that it's going to have like serious pharmacological effects. And because it's just bovine thyroid extract, you don't know how much you're getting. And if you're taking a thyroid medication that can increase, because the thing is with bovine thyroid, it has a greater affinity to human thyroid than human thyroid does. Mm. So it will it will increase thyroid activity. Um, and that can cause all sorts of problems long term. So the question centered around, is there any long term health negatives to taking products like this? And I would say if there are going to be any, it'll be potentially because of that product. I don't recommend anyone who you doesn't have a medical reason for using thyroid would ever use thyroid. Like, it's just a bad idea. Yeah. Um, so, so there's that straight up. So the other interesting ingredient basically Tom, in there is your himbin. Tom, the, so, the, the theory with that then is that compound in there, in your opinion there, because it would, in theory, have a boost in metabolic rate. Yeah. So it would increase thyroid activity that would increase metabolic rate. I mean, bodybuilders have been using exogenous thyroid for years to lose fat, and it is very effective, but it is not without side effects, and it's not without risks. Like, if you overuse thyroid, you can make yourself hypothyroid, um, and you'll then need to be on thyroid replacement medication for the rest of your life. Now, I don't think that the dosage in this product would be high enough to cause that by any means. If it was, it probably wouldn't be legal. But messing around with your endocrine system is, generally speaking, a bad idea. So I wouldn't recommend this product based on that. Um, But the other ingredient which is interesting is your himbin. So what your himbin does is when you take it, it activates your sympathetic nervous system. So 
catecholamines, including adrenaline, noradrenaline, spread around your body and do their thing. So one of the things that catecholamines can do is they'll bind to fat cells and will cause fat cells to release fat for burning, essentially. Um, but the interesting thing is that fat cells have alpha receptors and beta receptors, and they don't really do the same thing. So if something binds to a beta receptor on a fat cell, the fat cell will release fatty acids for burning and you'll lose additional fat. If, however, something binds to an alpha receptor, that will inhibit fat loss from that specific cell. And the theory goes that that's kind of where stubborn fat loss comes in. So if you've got certain areas where your fat cells have a higher amount of alpha receptors, that fat will be more difficult to lose. Now, that's not saying that you can't lose it. If you got very lean, it would go away, but that would be like the last place that the fat gets lost from. So generally speaking, in females, that would be around their hips. In males, it would be around your lower back, in essence. Um, and what your himbin can do is it can actually not only increase catecholamine activity, but it will actually bind to the alpha receptors and stop anything else binding to them, which means that it essentially stops the process by which fat cells can become resistant to fat loss, therefore helping you shift stubborn fat. That's kind of the theory of why your himbin works. Um, and it is actually very effective. The only things that you need to bear in mind are that A, you need to use your himbin in a fasted state because insulin basically stops this happening. So if you're going to be doing fasted cardio, your himbin can potentially augment the effects slightly. Um, and also it's just, it's a serious stimulant. Like if you're someone that's particularly stressed anyway, if you're someone that's always wired, if you're someone that's very sensitive to stimulants, your himbin is going to screw you up. So it, it's not a good idea. But if, and as well, you need to bear in mind that stubborn fat is only something that should concern people who are very, very, very lean. Because other than that, you don't need to lose stubborn fat. You just need to lose fat in general. And a simple calorie deficit can do that. So We're talking about the, physique athletes here, right? This is where it would be used in a physique yeah, athlete. Yeah, like, I wouldn't you know, recommend anyone percent. other than physique athletes take your him. And I mean, it would be effective, but truthfully, the, the augmentation of fat loss that you get from your himbin is going to be minimal unless you are the type of person that is that lean that minimal fat loss is something that you're concerned about. Mm. Um, and then I would just recommend just get your himbin. It's cheap. Research the dosage. It works out at about 0.2 milligrams per kilogram of body weight. Um, take it in a fasted state and try to reduce stimulants for the rest of the day because you're going to be wired. But other than that, <laughs> other than that, I, I don't see the point in using your himbin. I mean, it is effective, and if you want to use it, kind of fine. But in my eyes, it's kind of as we were just saying before, like a calorie deficit is going to do the same thing. And unless you're down to the last bits of stubborn fat that you're struggling to lose, then you can lose as much fat as you're going to lose in a standard day anyway just by eating less. So your himbin isn't a necessary ingredient there. Mm. Um, and can I just, for me, with clarification on... Because I want to talk about physique because I, I do genuinely believe that there's an amazing amount of people with different levels of body dysmorphia. And when yeah. we talk about stubborn fat, you know, we're talking about someone that might be at like 6% body fat. They have got an area that they consider a stubborn body fat where they could maybe pinch it between your index finger and your thumb. And, you know, we're talking about a little bit here. There's nothing, like if I could grab it with a couple of fingers and a thumb or a hand, like this is not stubborn body fat. We're talking about, you know, where someone looks really lean and then it kind of just smooths out a bit because there's a bit of extra fat padding there. This is really what we're looking at. And this has got to be like 0.2% of people. Yeah, that. I mean, most, most people will have stubborn fat, but the thing is you can't see it because it's covered by normal fat. Mm. And... As you say, like if if you don't have fully visible abs, shoulder separations, don't worry about stubborn fat. Just eat properly. Mm. <laughs> like it, it's not difficult to get very lean. Like you can get beach lean without ever worrying about stubborn fat. Stubborn fat is, as you say, it's something that will affect physique athletes. And at that point, that's where I would say, right, if you're a physique athlete, if you're in the last couple of weeks of prep, 
if you're not being coached, which you probably should be, that's where I would start doing your research. Outside of that specific population, I wouldn't worry about these kinds of things because it's just not important. Mm. Um, and that's kind of all I really had to say on that one. Um, the other thing that I was kind of circling around to mention is that this has a neurostim blend, which is caffeine and acetyl tyrosine, which is probably why he's starting to he feels a bit more energetic. Um, if you're concerned about sort of losing energy while in a fat loss phase, which you might do, some people get affected by fat loss more than others, um, a cup of coffee and if you wanted to supplement with acetyl tyrosine, you could. It, it's cheap to buy on its own. Yeah. Um, just do it that way. Um, but that really, the yohimbin and the tyrosine are the only two things in this product outside of caffeine that I would worry about taking. Everything else, I mean, it's got willow bark in. I don't know why that's never been linked to fat loss at all. It helps with joints. Um, it's got, it's called Google Lipid P extract. If you combine that with a hypercaloric diet, exercise, and a bunch of other factors, there's a minor augmentation of fat loss. Don't think that's really warranting taking taking it. Just eat slightly less, and nothing else really does anything. So Fair that's enough. that product. <laughs> I think so. As a as a kind of a a circle round to summarise that, I wouldn't take it because of the thyroid extracts. I think they're not likely to be, but potentially dangerous. And everything else, just look at your diet wholesale. And if you are very lean, your diet's absolutely on point. Consider taking potentially your Himbin, but research it probably. Mm. And I just want to clarify that the aim of this was not to pick a product and say this product shit or to badmouth anyone because that is not my style and there's enough of that going on in the fitness industry as it is. It's for us to sit here as individuals concerned with our health to be critical thinkers about saying okay is there research behind this product is there research behind the ingredients okay some there is some there isn't and you know again it, it comes back to what the the company is saying certain products can do you know there's a lot of claims in fitness and nutrition that are made and we have to be able to say okay is that claim warranted and by looking at the ingredients we can then start to say okay actually potentially this company might be over egging what this product can do uh, and i'm not saying this company is or they they are um sorry they are or they aren't i'm just making us aware of what we should be doing as consumers just like you know if we looked at uh our supplement company uh or some supplements you know there's one product we've got that doesn't have very good research behind it with looking at all the mechanistic ways that we see or potentially feel that transdermal magnesium has an effect but at least we say that on the website we don't really know how it works but we genuinely feel it works and it's a case that people then make that educated decision but we have to be wary of people saying there's research here and if there isn't then we need to find that so we can critically look at whether we would make an informed decision or can make an informed decision to buy something or not. Oh, absolutely. I mean, I will say wholesale that Anabolic Designs as a company, I quite like them. Um, they do their research. Their, all of their products, I mean, as I was looking back through the fat burning thing, all of the, thing, all of the ingredients in there, they've got a small amount of human data that says there might be a small effect towards fat loss. But Anabolic Designs pitch their products at physique competitors. So they are the people who need that extra 1-2%. Mm. And kind of the, the overarching point of this conversation really should be if you're outside of the specific population to which a product is pitched, then you're outside of the population. Like, it's not for you, yeah. if that makes sense. Um, if, however, you are part of that population, then... Yeah, consider it if you've got the money go and spare. There's minor amounts of research to say that it might help a little bit. If minor amounts of research that say it might help a little bit is enough to justify you making the purchase, it's certainly enough. It's certainly enough to justify it being on the market. And if it's enough to justify you making the purchase, then go ahead and make it. There's significantly worse companies out there to buy from. Mm. Um, I think looking at the other product. Um, I mean, to just talk about glucose disposal agents in general. So 
the principle here is twofold because it depends kind of on what you would take it for. So people will often use glucose disposal agents for the wrong reasons. So the idea that some have is that if I take this, it will reduce the insulin spike because glucose is being disposed of in my cells. Less insulin means less fat gain. Kind of not how it works. Glucose disposal agents are marketed so that when you carb up, when you refeed, you more effectively use those carbohydrates, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. So glucose disposal agents are something you would use while gaining weight as opposed to losing weight, if they work. Um, the one mentioned, it's got a bunch of ingredients in, but to just kind of speak generally, glucose disposal agents are kind of a shifty subject because... Most of the time, the ingredients that do work, they're not tissue specific. So yes, they will help cells suck glucose up, but that doesn't mean it's just muscle cells. So it will help fat cells suck glucose, suck glucose up as well. I mean, so you've got like cinnamon and fenugreek and chromium, all of these kind of help, but cinnamon and fenugreek, if you take them at very high doses, they will help non-tissue specific cells suck up glucose. So you're gonna be storing glucose in fat cells just as much as you are muscle cells. Um, chromium is another one that's popularized. So chromium is used in sort of normal metabolic function. So if you're deficient in chromium, you're gonna have issues with glucose disposal. You're gonna have issues with sort of your blood glucose. But if you are not deficient in chromium, then taking additional chromium doesn't help. Um, but the two probably main ones that are on the market are ALA and berberine. So I found a couple of like a couple of papers on this. So RALA basically, if you give it to a diabetic person, it will help to remove glucose from their blood. But there's kind of the definitive study on this. It's in rats, but it's kind of the definitive study on this. Um, it's a paper from 2002 by, I couldn't even pronounce the lead researcher's name. So the second researcher's name is Perez. <laughs> um, came out in 2002. And basically what they did is they, they took four groups of rats. One group exercised, one group was sedentary, one group exercised and took RALA, and one group was sedentary and took RALA. And what they found was in non-diabetic rats, RALA doesn't augment the glucose disposal effect of exercise. So when you train, your muscles become more sensitive to glucose because the glucose transporters within muscle, tissue, within muscle cells get translocated to the surface. So what that means is there's a little protein that sits on the muscle cell and it helps glucose enter. And that only goes to the surface of the cell during specific circumstances. Exercise will cause that to happen. RALA will not augment that effect. So basically, if you're not diabetic, RALA doesn't help. Um, the other one is berberin. So berberin is a herb extract, and it's actually a really effective glucose disposal agent. It's been shown to be as effective as metformin, the diabetic drug, at helping diabetics regulate their glucose disposal. So if you're diabetic, you could potentially take berberin. I'm not a doctor. Don't do that because I've said so, but that's what the research says. So ignore me. Always speak to a doctor. I'm not a doctor. Um, so berberin is similar to metformin in its ability to remove glucose from the blood. However, how it does this is it activates something called AMP-activated protein kinase. So everyone's heard of ATP, I assume. ATP, adenosine triphosphate, is the thing in your, in your cells that allows energy to be stored and used. You use ATP to do stuff. ATP, adenosine triphosphate, is an adenosine with three phosphate groups, triphosphate. Adenosine monophosphate is that molecule having already been used for a bunch of energy, so it's only got one phosphate left. Um, so what that means is, as a cell uses all of its ATP up, 
AMP starts to build up within the cell. That is then used to signal to the cell that it's low on energy. And berberine basically increases AMP content. So when the cell's low on energy, it'll do two things. First of all, it'll start sucking glucose out of the blood. So that is how berberine reduces blood glucose. But AMPK also reduces muscle protein synthesis because the cell that's low on energy doesn't need to be engaging in protein synthesis because otherwise you'd end up jacked and dead. <laughs> so, so yes, although berberine will reduce blood glucose, you've got two considerations. First of all, it's as effective as metformin. And if you're not, if you're not diabetic, the last thing you need is to be reducing blood glucose to the level that metformin can do, because that can leave you hypoglycemic and that can kill you. And secondly, it activates the process by which muscle protein synthesis is inhibited. So it can also reduce the amount of muscle that you build. So I don't recommend people take berberine. And as a wider point, I don't recommend you take glucose disposal agents because they're either ineffective, harmful, counterproductive or non-tissue specific. So it's not a product that's really worth considering from any company in any sort of form. If you are diabetic, do what your doctor tells you. <laughs> if, if we looked at the realities of both of these supplements, so these supplements in my eyes were kind of talking about three, four, five, maybe 6% of additional benefit. And what yeah. we're looking at now is enhancement of basic physiology but like beyond a level that has a certain amount of uh side effects or contraindications where we have to say okay that extra three percent is going to put this this and that system under stress so when we look at fat burning agents yes we might get an upregulation upregulation in uh, metabolic rate and energy burn for, for, as a result of more movement that kind of stuff are we then putting our central nervous system at, on, upon greater stress? Are we affecting sleep? Are we affecting energy to a degree that that extra 3% is counterproductive? Same with glucose disposal agents. We have physiolo physiological systems within our body that are designed to do this. We've just talked about them. And what these mm -hmm. products are doing are potentially enhancing it to a degree, but that mm -hmm. enhancement now has a potential side effect. And some of those yeah, side that effects actually sound quite profound. Yeah, exactly. I mean, it's that whole thing of like every action has an equal and equal opposite reaction. Like there is no such thing as a product that's going to have some physiological effect that's positive that doesn't come with side effects. Like it, it just isn't a thing. And I mean, to talk on like a really broad scale, a lot of products bar in the very basics, so things like creatine, protein powders, fish oils, all of that, when your supplements start to get really fancy, what they're trying to do is they're trying to mimic the effects of drugs. Mm. So if you're taking a fat burner, you're doing that because you are trying to mimic the effects of slightly more harmful things that are slightly less legal. Mm. And realistically, None of them are as effective, but some of them have the, have the same or worse side effects. And realistically, it's just not something worth messing with. If you are someone who is making money from this, then do what you want to do. If you're a recreational exerciser, if you're in this for looking a bit better and being healthy, the side effects are just not worth it. And, and if your goal is to be healthier, then taking these products, it, it just goes against that ultimate goal anyway. Mm. So it's not something that I would worth. Cons it's not something that I would consider personally. Mm. If people want to consider them, they're they're free to do so. But I would say always be incredibly careful to research every product that you take because the claims that supplement companies make will not include the side effects. I mean, it's as I just explained about there about berberine. If I said, yeah, it's as effective as metformin and stop there, that sounds really good. Mm. But you have to look a bit further into it. And if, in my opinion, looking that far into it is something that you don't really feel like you want to do, you don't feel like you have time to do, just don't take the product. No. Like, 
you're going to get lean anyway. You're going to get jacked anyway. Like, it, you'll be fine. You don't need this thing. It might have a beneficial effect, but there's, if it's going to benefit you, there's a good chance that it's going to have a side effect. And if you're not able, and if you're not fully aware of what those side effects are going to be, it's a risk that you're taking that I just don't see is worth it. I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna finalise this talk uh, chat today by being a little bit nasty, in the fact that everyone that every everything that everyone does needs to take responsibility for the actions that the, they take, and I think it is great and endearing that we trust our coaches, you know, but when you're looking at some of the more extreme sides of the changes that you can make in someone's appearance or their physique. You mm -hmm. have to do your own research. So I firmly believe that in health and fitness, if you want to be as successful as humanly possible, you have to get into it. Like mm -hmm. you have to get into nutrition and understand it. The same with training, the same with supplements. It's, it's their life skills, right? It's just like me doing the career that I'm doing and you doing the career that you're doing. You have to get into that career. You have to understand how to be better at that job. So you have to become a disciple of that. You have to do the same. And the reason why I bring this up is I've met so many bikini competitors, you know, physique type people where they're like, oh, my coach put me on this and this and this. And I'm like, you've got to take a certain amount of responsibility for that. It's not all your coach's fault. Like if, if someone, you know, and I've had people that have listed off a massive handful of drugs. And I'm like, I would not take any of that. You know, if I'm going to the, in fact, I'm going to the doctors today. And if the doctor says something to me where I'm not really sure about or unsure of what the compound's going to do, I have to say to the doctor, I'm sorry, can you explain what that's going to do and what the side effects might be? Because I need to be informed about that decision. He's a yeah. doctor. I trust the fact that this medicine can work, but I need to know the potential side effects of that. And there's many side effects to many medicines and compounds and steroids and all sorts of stuff. So... I, you know, I, I, I get that there's a lot of irresponsible activity in fitness, but you have to take responsibility for what goes in your body. You have to take responsibility for the thoughts that you have, the actions that you make, the decisions that you decide to do. We are still in control. And, you know, I, there's only so much sympathy I have when people move blame around because we are in charge. Mm -hmm, definitely. And I think as well, it's very easy to say, oh, yeah, they're the potential side effects, but it won't happen to me. Mm. But everyone thinks that, and they're going to happen to somebody. Um, it's a very lucky person that can take, especially drugs, and not experience any side effects. Yeah. And if you don't experience any in the short term, that's not to say you won't experience any in the long term. So always just do your due diligence and do your research. I mean, if you then decide, okay, this is what I'm going to do, these are the consequences, and I'm comfortable with that, then that is your informed decision as an adult, which is fine. But if it's not an informed decision, it's a bad idea. Mm. Even if it works out well, it was luck. And I think making informed decisions is something that we all need to do. And if you're not able to make an informed decision, what you need to do is hang fire until you are. Wait, don't like people get so impatient about this kind of shit. And like, you know, I want to lose fat now, and they go on and they start doing the research on the website, they read the claims, and then all of a sudden they've bought it, and three days later they're taking it. And it's like, look, nothing's good, nothing bad is going to happen, and only really positive things are going to happen if you take a week extra to do your research. Wait till the weekend yeah. where you can sit down for a couple of hours and and do your research and. Actually, I'm just going to finish off by kind of saying that to a degree I'm pro-steroids from the fact and from the perspective that if people want to spend so much time playing around with half compounds, like compounds that are trying to do what steroids do, and there are loads of these drugs, mm -hmm. you are better off seeing someone that is very well versed in steroid use, can put you through a cycle safely and to come out the other side with the exact benefit that you want. If you spend the next six months taking a bit of this, a bit of that, doing this, you're probably going to cause yourself some damage. So 
I am not for or against steroids. I'm for or against people doing things for the right reasons for them. If you generally stand there and say, I want to look like a physique guy. I want to be ripped. I want to be highly muscular. I want to go beyond what I think is my genetic potential. Then the chances are, realistically, you're going to have to take steroids to do that. And I'm not mm. saying that's a bad thing. I'm saying it's an informed decision that you've made for an outcome that you want. Then go and see the right kind of people. Someone like Dave Crossland, who's been on this show, fantastic guy, hugely humble, hugely knowledgeable. He would be someone that you'd seek out. I would much rather you did that than spent painless months buying things off shady websites. You know, And I'm not saying any particular websites or the supplements we've talked about today are shady. No. We know what we're talking about. We know what happens in fitness. Just do shit properly. Yeah, I mean, pro hormones is something that I've never particularly agreed with um, because they're basically less effective and have more side effects than the real thing. Mm. So, and also, if you take a pro hormone, you're not quote unquote natural anymore anyway. So, other than the legality, I mean, as you said, we're not condoning or and we're certainly not recommending steroid use but if you're the type of person that's going to do it anyway then pro hormones aren't the way to do it and i'll say that <laughs> yeah. we can go into specific if, if someone wants to email me email me and ask me about specific ones they're welcome to but it's not a good idea mm. as you said just do because if you use the real thing, at least then you know what the effects are, you know what the side effects are, and there's research to show you what to do. Pro hormone that you buy off Big Dave at the gym, like there's just nothing. You're just taking a pill and a bottle and hoping for the best. Mm. Right, Tom, we're going to wrap up the show there. Uh, we have rambled on long enough. I hope people have enjoyed this. If you have, please please reach out to us on social media. Say something, say hello. Um, Tom is not very active, unfortunately, on social media. He's basically too busy no. doing <laughs> stuff that I tell him to do. <laughs> um, but if you do want more of you know, Tom's knowledge... Um, the Body Type Nutrition Academy, Tom is a huge part of the Body Type Nutrition Academy, teaches and mentors our students through their journey. Um, our next course starts early August, uh, which is the new and revised Foundation Academy. Um, a lot of details will be coming about that in July when we have our new website built, the new syllabus, the new program, the new everything finished and done ahead of our kind of launch. But that's where Tom spends a lot of his time We've spoken about supplements today, so I will mention um, examine.com. Examine.com is a great resource to find out you know, what supplements to take and why. We use it as a reference point as awesome supplements for a lot of easy to digest, you know, simple, straightforward supplements. Feel free to check out awesome supplements. There's also a lot of sports guides on the website, so if you play you know, badminton, if you do CrossFit, if you do bodybuilding, there's guides on the websites that kind of talks about what supplements you would generally take if you did that. So if you want a little bit of advice, go there. Um, otherwise, uh, that's it from us. Tom, thank you very much for your time and energy into this podcast, the research that you've done leading up to the show today as well. Thank you very much. Um, if people do want to find me on social media, just look at Facebook. I, I, I don't really go beyond that. I think I've posted twice on Instagram. <laughs> <laughs> that so. is true, yeah. Um, so, yeah, Tom, uh, Tom, how do you spell your name so people know? Um, B-A-I-N and then bridge, like what you'd walk over. Nice and simple. Awesome. Um, I think my picture's me doing a stupid selfie and big sunglasses, so... Awesome. Oh, yeah, with my girlfriend sat in the background looking really bemused. <laughs> So. <laughs> standard yeah alright and thank you Tom thank you for everyone for listening uh, and we will see you or I will see you I don't know when Tom will see you we haven't got that far organised yet but I will see you <laughs> next Thursday goodbye hey everyone Ben Coon Radio episode number 262